Hi, my name is Ross, and today we're in 2 Kings 2 and 3. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace. The songwriter marvels at grace. What is it about grace that has captured his deep admiration? Let's look for grace to appear in this week's Bible reading. Now, to appreciate the transition of God's prophet to Israel from Elijah to Elisha, we need to have Elijah's history and Elisha's call freshly in mind. Elijah had a reputation established with miracles that surrounded him and a showdown with Ahab and the 850 idolatrous prophets. He was revered. People recognized that God was with him and gave him a wide berth. But as heroic as Elijah was, we saw his weak side too. At least on one occasion, he complained to God that he was the only one left. Even though there were facts to the contrary, God told him that there were 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal. But God may have figured that assurance was not going to cheer Elijah's heart. What may have been just what Elijah needed came from God having him call Elisha in 1 Kings 19. Out of that call, Elijah and Elisha spent years together with Elisha learning from him. I'd say it was likely that those two were close friends. What we do know is that Elisha had devotion and great regard for his master, Elijah. And we know, excuse me, and people knew that Elisha was devoted to Elijah. Even one of Joram's officers knew that Elisha poured water on the hands of Elijah, in other words, served him. From our previous study of Elijah, we get the idea of Elijah's stature among the prophets. But I think that, albeit indirectly, Elisha was also held up as an example by Jesus. Luke 9 records this. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say, Goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God, for service in the kingdom of God. Those verses remind me of the call of Elisha. Remember what Elijah said about wanting to kiss his father and mother goodbye? Remember that he burned his plow? It seems to me that Elisha never looked back. Looking at the context Around Luke 9, it says if it's as if Jesus was saying this, consider my servant Elisha, who sacrificed his profitable business to serve the kingdom and never look back. Let's pray before we continue. Father in heaven, open our eyes to more of what you have for us to learn from your word tonight. Increase our devotion and reverence for you. Your servants pray this in Jesus' name. So, we have kindred souls here. First, Elijah, who's named the Lord is God. And the second, Elisha, who is named God saves. When you read this week's notes, you will see how Elijah and Elisha foreshadow John the Baptist and Jesus. You'll want to ponder those parallels. Now, as we read the opening verses of 2 Kings 2, we discover that Elijah, Elisha, and all the prophets knew that this was the day that Elijah was to be taken. Each company of prophets thinks it's a good idea to mention that to Elisha. But it's painful for Elisha to hear that message of separation. Verse, in verses 2 and 5, we read, Yeah, I know, Elijah replied. But don't speak of it. I find this puzzling. Elijah tells Elisha to hang back. But Elisha was not having it. We hear Elisha saying, I'm not leaving you. Stated with an oath of sorts. It seems like this is some sort of test of determination. At this point, Elijah rolls up his cloak or mantle and strikes the water of the Jordan. It sounds like a locker room towel snap to me. Of course, this miracle reminds us of both the crossing of the Red Sea and the crossing of the Jordan with the Jordan 
with dry feet by the, Isra by the Israelites back in the day. It appears to me that Elijah's persistence pays off when Elijah asks, Elisha, what would you have me do for you? In a certain sense, this is Elijah showing Elisha the full extent of his love when the master seeks to serve his servant before he leaves him. I love Elisha's answer. Elisha says, I want your job. Now, he didn't say that. But what Elisha did say was, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. So think about this. What was it that Elisha admired in Elijah? It was Elijah's spirit. Elijah lived a life that was characterized by having God's spirit. And Elijah wanted a double portion of that. Who gets a double portion in, in, in an inheritance? It's the firstborn son. And what will the, be that son's business? Well, it'll be his father's business, of course. Elisha was asking to carry on Elijah's mission, empowered by God's spirit. Elijah says, hey, you've asked for a difficult thing. Now, it can't be difficult for God to give a spirit or anything else for that matter. So the difficult part must have to do with the nature of the job that Elisha was taking. So when Elijah says, you ask a difficult thing, he must be saying, you had better count the cost. Because with that call comes suffering. Philippians 3.10 is a surprising verse because it actively chooses the fellowship of sharing in Christ's sufferings. And yet, Elisha was signing up for this sort of suffering. Elijah gave Elisha the typical parental response to tough requests when he said, we'll see. In verse 11, Elijah and Elisha walked and talked, which reminds me how Enoch walked and talked with God in Genesis 5 before God took Enoch away. What a precious time this must have been. Elijah was passing on his job to, to a truer son than blood. Elisha was getting prayed over by a truer father than could be had by bloodline. Those kinds of conversations just cannot be ended neatly because you want to stay there in the moment. It was the appearance, excuse me, it was the appearance of the chariots of fire and the horses of fire that ended the conversation. Now, once separated, Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. I suppose the company of prophets witnessing this would have said to each other, look how much he loved him. Verse 13 makes me think of, makes me think Elisha shook it off directly. And I get the feeling that he had something of Elijah's style in his next move. Elisha then picked up Elisha's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood at the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and left, and he crossed over company of prophets from Jericho who were watching said, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. At this point, all can see that Elisha has taken up Elijah's mantle, which is called a cloak in the NIV. It is at this point that the prophets cook up an idea that Elisha might not be actually gone, but sat down somewhere else. Remember, it was Obadiah who first expected Elijah to be whisked away just to pop up someplace else. Elijah told them not to do it, but they had to prove it to themselves. And maybe they had to prove it to the rest of us who are slow to believe 1 Thess Thessalonians 4.17, which goes like this. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Parting the Jordan 
was Elisha miracle number one. Number two was healing the water of Jericho. Remember Jericho, the city that was cursed if it was ever rebuilt? Elijah removed the curse and healed the water with salt in a bowl. Two items that appear in the Sermon on the Mount in reference to the effect believers have on the world around them. And that's Matthew 5.16. <clears throat> Remember that Elijah warned Elisha that the, that the road would involve suffering? He first had to suffer those doubters who wanted to look for Elijah when he knew better. And now he had to face the threat of a roving youth gang. Look, I was a boy once. Nothing, nothing good comes from boys left to roam unsupervised. And the bigger the group, the worse. In this case, a large group of miscreants tells the ball guy to scram, likely reflecting the conversation of their absentee parents. Elisha calls down a curse on them, and 42 boys get a valuable but painful lesson. Curses and blessings. Joshua told you to expect this. Curses and blessings. The mauling is miracle number three. Jesus once told the people that they ought to believe on him in, on account of his miracles alone. Besides the other better reasons, these miracles are signs that Elisha spoke for God. Just as a side, the people who count such things tell me that Elijah had seven miracles associated with him, and Elisha had 13, until you count the miracle Elisha pulled off after his death in 2 Kings 13, and that made it 14 miracles. Thus, Elisha had double the recorded miracles of Elijah, giving a, giving a second meaning to the double portion. I struggle to put a neat bow on this section, but here's what I notice. God cared deeply for his servants and challenged them to big obedience. Both Elijah and Elisha had a hard life, but lived a life speaking for the king of kings. They had years of God's preparation with moments when they rose to the occasion to confront Israel's kings, but God ministered to them throughout. And God knows how to give good gifts to his children. To the one who was convinced he was alone, God gave a companion. And to the one who had a family and a good job, he drew him into a greater purpose in full-time service for God's kingdom. How, just like our grace-giving God it is, to give them a deep friendship with that sort of companionship. God equipped them and trained them and trusted them with significant work and can commended them. And in Elijah's case, did the jaw-dropping act of taking Elijah directly to heaven without experiencing death. At work, I was asked to give a career story to a group of high school students who are in our intern program. On the last page of my presentation, I had peppered the page with names of guys that poured into me through the years shaping me for how I'm now able to contribute. I had tens of names on that acknowledgement page. As I prepared this talk, it struck me that I could do the same for my spiritual formation. It's clear that God is just not concerned about the cost. He sent his best to pour into me, even though I'm slow of heart to embrace the growth he intends for me. I mean this, God sent his best. This sort of over-the-top giving is characteristic of my God. He is just predisposed to the undeserving. It's inseparable in his nature. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. Let's make that the principle for this section. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. <clears throat> Who has God sent to pour into you? Will you thank God for this good, good gift? Will you praise him for his grace-giving nature? We saw our heroes of faith share in God's suffering. Perhaps God has a command for you that involves some pain. Will you pray for the willingness to enter into it? Will I pray for that willingness? 
Elisha set his hand to the plow and didn't look back. To what next thing is God directing your vision? In the last words of chapter 2, we find that Elisha, now confirmed his position as God's prophet, headed back to Samaria via Mount Carmel. Samaria is a leading city in Israel, and Israel is steeped in idol worship. We see God's best deployed for the people who should know better, but remain in idol worship. Let's find out how God chooses to deal with Israel's king. First, we're introduced to Joram, Ahab's second son, who became king after Ahab's first son, Ahaziah, died, according to Elijah's prophecy. Joram is described as better than Ahab, but having the same sins as Jeroboam. Joram is bugged that Moab stopped tribute payments once Ahab died and manages to get Edom and Judah's king Jehoshaphat to go to war with him against Moab. Jehoshaphat's got no business using his citizenry's blood and wealth to pursue God-haters, to pursue wars for God-haters like Joram. The lesson here, avoid entanglements, and certainly entanglements with unbelievers. Don't do it. Partnerships are easy to form and difficult to break up. So they go to war, they march around in the desert, run out of water, and now they're in crisis. They think they're vulnerable to Moab at this point, unless they get some water. The king of Israel is sticking to his flimsy claim that he's on a mission from God. But Jehoshaphat decides it's time to find a prophet of the Lord. The king is apparently ignorant of Elisha, but one of his officers knows of Elisha. And interestingly, he describes him as the one who used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Water is what their army needs. Elisha tells the king of Israel to go to the prophets of Ahab and Jezebel, calling out Joram's fakery. Elisha seems to have no fear as he tells the king of Israel that the king, as far as he's concerned, is invisible. But he does recognize the king of Judah. So, for Jehoshaphat's sake, he will inquire the Lord. Well, Elijah tells him to start digging ditches because the water's coming. But without wind and rain, the natural way for water to show up. And he goes on to prophesy the destruction of Moab. The next morning, the land fills with water coming from the direction of the desert, again, against the natural watershed. Moab gets it in their head that the three armies, Edom, Moab, Israel, excuse me, Edom, Judah, Israel, wiped each other out and moves in for the plunder. Where would they get this idea? Well, it happened to them in 2 Corinthians 20 under Jehoshaphat's reign. Moab, Ammon, and Edom wiped each other out while warring against Jehoshaphat. Moab's rush for plunder resulted in them getting ambushed and defeated. Their land was laid waste until Moab makes a furious stand repelling them and stopping the war. The text says Israel withdrew at that point. I suspect they were supposed to have continued the battle until instructed otherwise, not quit when the resistance peaked. Well, Israel, whose king is weaving a false story through this whole misadventure, got rescued with the involvement of God's prophet called in by Judah's king. So Israel gets rescued for Judah's sake. I guess you would call that grace, good stuff being extended to the undeserving. No, but there's more to this grace stuff than just good stuff coming to the undeserving. Let's explore that. Well, everybody wants something for nothing, right? I know humans like to win stuff or finagle stuff, but I'm not convinced that humans like to receive a straight up undeserved gift. People like to earn stuff. Earning stuff feeds our pride. We like a transaction. The unstated thought is, I got this because I'm pretty good. Or at least I'm better than him. We get something and we go to work justifying why we deserve it. I agree with someone's observation that Humans have an illogical resistance to the idea of grace. 
I'm guessing that in our broken thinking, we say, oh, come on, there can't be someone out there who lives to extend favor to me, even in my rebellion. Nope, doesn't work that way. And yet, it's God's nature to be gracious. He offers goodness and salvation to those who deserve only judgment. A verse from our hymn says, Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Take note of the word and. Grace is God's unmerited gift of salvation. And grace is God's empowering for service that pleases him. It's one thing to think about what grace is. It's a better thing to worship in astonishment at the gracious nature of our God. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace. Let's recall how grace shows up in 2 Kings 2 and 3. <clears throat> These chapters include both Elijah and Elisha, dudes with an exceptional commitment to God. And where were they stationed? In Israel, the land of the rebel kings, from Jeroboam to number 7, Ahab the worst. And now Joram, come on, bad king number 9. And God sends him his best guys to lay truth on them and bail them out from time to time. I'm thinking, lost cause. Leave them. God is thinking, more grace, more truth. But while I'm still disgusted with Israel, if someone were to ask me what sort of God I'd prefer, my head would sink in shame and say, one who would bail me out yet again, and one who would lay truth on me. Yeah, your buddy Ross needs yet another do-over. I often pray for God to pick me up and set me in the right direction. But I need so much more than a reset. I need to see my need for God's grace to me. I need to know that we're still on speaking terms. I need to know that he loves me and expects the best of me. I need his truth, his leadership, his example. I need to cry out with David, don't take your spirit from me. Okay, so we see in the passage, we see God's grace to those who don't appear to be changed by it. Most in this room are familiar with God's amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. It's God's grace that saved us, as in literally saved us, at great cost. So, while in full-on rebellion, we needed grace. When saved from eternal death, we needed grace. And going forward, we need grace. But that's not obvious to me. There was a decade in my far past when old folks would say something like this. Hey, Ross, what's the good word? I never knew what to say, how to respond. But now, if I were to hear, hey, Ross, what's the good word? Perhaps I would think, oh, benediction, good word. Now, it just so happens that many of the books of the New Testament, they open and close with a benediction. <clears throat> Preachers are in the habit of quoting one of those benedictions just before you head out, y'all head out the church door. In one oft-repeated phrase, grace to you, the Bible author is trying to give you a gift of God's grace. The longtime churchgoers among us have heard this a thousand times. Here's my question. Why does a saved person need yet more grace? I have it on good authority that we don't need saving again. Somehow, the New Testament writer, letter writer, is convinced that I'm going to need grace soon after I set down that Bible. Well, the pessimists among us might suggest, well, we're going to need that grace because we're going to mess up soon again. But I don't think that's it. You know, what Elisha noticed in Elijah and wanted, Elisha wanted the spirit that was on Elijah. You see, that spirit doesn't make us a little bit better than we would otherwise be. God's spirit allows us, empowers us to live above our human nature. It lets us live God's nature. So when we get sent out with a good word, when we get sent out with grace to you, the intent is for us to live as sons of Elijah. With what? With what sons inherit? A portion of the Spirit. Does that make sense? Well, 
Jesus tells his disciples as he was ascending, wait, wait until you receive the gift. And that gift showed up 10 days later at Pentecost. It is the Holy Spirit. He, the Spirit, is what allows us to live above our human nature. So I ask you, what's the good word? You could answer me, grace to you. And what will grace do for us? It won't improve our human nature. It will allow us to live above our human nature and live God's nature. And I claim this is why a saved person needs grace. It's what allows us to live up to our sonship. When trying to form a principle for this section, I looked at the grace shown to the three countries allied against Moab and the undeserved rescue they received. It's true that even those in rebellion and never repent and never cling to Jesus still get God's common grace. But that's not a principle that applies to you. You guys are here because you either are tentatively attracted to God's saving grace or you've already encountered saving grace by the one who lives to be gracious. So let's form a principle from the relationship Elijah and Elisha had with God as described in these two chapters. What did the company of prophets declare? The spirit of Elisha is resting on, excuse me, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. What did Jehoshaphat say of Elisha? The word of the Lord is with him. What did the narrator tell us? The hand of the Lord came on Elisha. Jesus was speaking of himself when he said this in John 3, but it would apply to his prophets also. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the spirit without limit. So what is it that allowed Elijah and Elisha to live above their human nature and speak for God? The presence of a person, the Holy Spirit, a gift given without limit to all believers at Pentecost. The principle that I'd like to experience is this. The Holy Spirit enables us to live above our human nature. The Holy Spirit allows us to live above our human nature. Okay, we've got an infinity of moments where we don't live there. But for now, don't let your mind go there. Think of Elijah's admiration, not of Elisha the man, who, who the, excuse me, not of, think of Elisha's admiration, not for Elijah the man, who the Bible describes as a man just like us. But think of Elisha's admiration for Elijah when God's spirit was allowing him to live above his human nature. I've seen moments of this holy nature in God's people and am, and am awed. I'm awed, not in a, wow, you're awesome sort of way, but in a, wow, look at that God, take over in the person sort of way. On Saturday morning, I was talking with three of your discussion leaders. One expressed his awe of God's grace. Another loved and wished to tell about the availability of God's grace. The third testified to the power of God's grace to live the life God intended for him and of the victory available. That thinking is on point. One guy had in mind God's saving grace. Another had God's empowering grace. For, the, for victorious living in mind. How have you experienced God's grace? What facet of God's grace causes you to worship our gracious God? Elijah and Elisha were different people, chosen by God for their time and mission. James says of Elijah that he was a man just like us and earnestly prayed. Jesus may have had Elisha in mind when he spoke of being qualified for the service in his kingdom setting his hand to the plow and not looking back. Your experience of God's grace along your life path qualifies you for a different but significant kingdom mission. Pray earnestly for that mission and don't look back. I ain't a preacher, but let me give you a good word. Grace to you. Father in heaven, it is your spirit in us that allows us to live to please our master. Grant us this gift, whom you are willing to give the undeserving, 
for your glory without limit. Surprise us with a God takeover. In Jesus' name, amen.